Just a few months into the American Civil War, a sobering reality began to dampen the American psyche. Now, prior to the war, many people were actually looking forward to this fight. America had been founded on strong convictions. Fighting for your beliefs seemed to be part of the fabric of the country. It was noble. It was meaningful. But it was soon obvious that each of the two sides in this conflict had underestimated their opponent and misunderstood the price that had to be paid to settle their differences. In this, President Lincoln's responsibility in all of it was obvious. The Southern leaders had seceded, and it was Lincoln's job to reunite the nation. And to accomplish this, Lincoln put George B. McClellan in charge of the Northern Army. Now, by all accounts, McClellan was incredibly highly qualified. He looked the part. He had the education that was needed. He had proven to be very gifted at taking average men and turning them into a very well-disciplined army. His units, in fact, were so precise in their practice regimens that people would literally come out and watch them practice. That's how good they were at drilling that people would find entertainment value in, in watching them do their drills. And not only were his men well trained, but you see, his soldiers outnumbered the southern soldiers at a rate of three to one. So it would appear, at least on paper, that the north was poised for victory after a very early uh, defeat at Bull Run under McClellan's predecessor. If they were to act quickly, they could deliver a decisive and hopefully final blow, and turn the tide in their favor, and, and maybe even end the war very quickly. But McClellan waited. It seemed at first that this delay seemed like it might actually be wise. He was amassing resources and men. He was gathering intelligence. He was creating a, a glorious battle plan to match his exceptional army. July passed. Then August, then September, and then October. Finally, in late October, Congress was screaming at the president for the inaction. Lincoln decides he better go pay his leader a visit. Now, you might think that McClellan had gotten the message that it was time to move, right? But it wasn't until the next April when he makes his first small passing attempt to engage the South at Yorktown. And in that battle, he outnumbered his opponent 10 to 1. Yet, McClellan managed to take no ground and really accomplish nothing. This went on for the majority of 1862. And the final straw came when President Lincoln visited McClellan again near Antietam on the heels of yet another loss. And what the president saw with his own eyes was that McClellan's sense of responsibility for the army had changed into a sense of ownership. It had gone from responsibility to ownership. You see, McClellan was the model general, except for one thing. He had embraced the false assumption about the army and the men that he led. He began to think of it as his army. And as a result, he never quite managed to serve the true objective of war. And as generals go, McClellan was beyond rich, equipped far beyond his need. He had everything that he needed, but he lost sight of what he needed them for. McClellan wasn't all that different from today's rich Americans. And as we discovered last week, if you were here, nearly every single one of us in this room today is a rich American. We possessed more than most around the world could ever even dream of having. We have everything we need, but we often lose sight of what it is that we need it for. You see, Jesus taught his followers a rather interesting definition of greed. You see, Jesus said that greed is the assumption that everything placed into our hands is for our consumption. Brilliant, isn't that? You've probably, you've probably known 
numerous, perhaps even lots of people who had lots of different things in their possession, right? People who had lots of things in their hands. But it wasn't so much the things that they had that made them seem greedy. No, it was the fact of the things that they kept for themselves. It was when they, in fact, even went maybe a step further and began to think that everything they owned was intended for them. The scene where Jesus taught this concept is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. One day, Jesus was preaching to his followers, and as he's preaching, I mean, literally, like, in the third pew back, a fight starts. Two guys begin arguing while he's trying to preach, which would be interesting. Hopefully that doesn't happen today. One guy, he accuses another guy. He says, you're greedy. Well, the other guy goes, no, you're greedy. And they, you know, pot kettle black thing, right? They start just going back and forth. As he's trying to teach, he's like, come on, I'm up here preaching. And they're going at it right back in row three. So in response, Jesus begins to tell a story as was often Jesus' response. If you want to follow along, we're going to be in Luke 12 today. There are Bibles in the pew. You can open up an app on your phone or your iPad or whatever you got. Luke 12, 16, it says this. It says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So, pausing there, the farmer was blessed, right? And he had more than he needed. What is the farmer to do with the extra? I mean, read Jesus is, remember that Jesus is making up the story as he goes here. And he wanted to teach us the right and the wrong way to respond if we ever find ourselves in a situation where we have more than we need. And interestingly, uh, the rich farmer in Jesus' story did what I think a lot of us would have done and probably have done throughout the years. So Jesus continues on. And it says that the farmer thought to himself, after he realizes he's had a good year and has more crops than he needs, what shall I do, right? I have no place to store all of these crops. Place yourself in his shoes for a moment. You know, you wake up on Saturday morning, right? There's money in the bank, there's gas in the tank. How do you spend your day? You're going to make a trip over to Home Depot? Right? I like that idea. Let's go to Menards. I need stuff. What stuff? It doesn't matter. They have stuff. <laughs> Fleet Farm? Yeah. Maybe it's the sewing shop. Maybe you just go into the movies. Maybe go into the mall. Maybe out for dinner, right? You've got options is the idea. Time, treasure, talents at your disposal. Well, Jesus went on. Well, then the farmer said this, hey, here's, here's, here's what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger ones to store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. Right? Now, at first glance, sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? It's a good life. He's making a capital investment on his farm. I mean, so he'll be able to write that off on his taxes, right? And because he's saving, that looks like the wise thing to do. You would think at this point that Jesus would just wrap up the story and say, and he lived happily ever after. Amen. Wrong. That's not what Jesus did at all. Jesus throws us for a loop. Look at Luke 12, 20 and 21. But God said to the farmer, You fool! This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Ouch! Right? Didn't see that one coming. Talk about an unexpected downer there, Jesus. Thanks for that. But I bet that all of a sudden, all of the people, the two guys who were fighting back in row three, 
we're all of a sudden quickly paying attention, close attention, to what Jesus had to say. That surprising twist in the story directly mirrors a twist that we can all expect in our own story if we fail to heed Jesus' message. It's not that we'll necessarily and hopefully and probably won't die tonight, right? But we need to heed it. Our lives probably won't reflect if the stock market goes up and all of a sudden I make some more money, God's going to call us home that evening. If I get a raise at work, well, all of a sudden now Jesus is calling. Here I go. That's not the story. But if we only do with our money as the rich man did, there will indeed come a time, Jesus is telling us, suddenly, when we discover the foolishness of our actions. Like with most of what Jesus had to say, this parable was a dramatic shift from the conventional thinking of his time. I mean, whenever we have more than we need, our natural assumption is that it's for our consumption. But that's the wrong mindset. And Jesus exposes the flaw in that thinking. If we store up for ourselves and are not rich towards God, then everything we possess will be a total loss at the end of our lives, at the end of our time here on earth. But if we do something more in those times where we have more than we need, being generous towards God, then Jesus says it won't be a loss anymore. You heard this last week, 1 Timothy six seventeen through 19. It says this. It says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in in God, who so richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. If we overlay the teachings of Jesus and Paul here, if we take these two different sets of commands for rich people, we get a plan for avoiding this pitfall. Paul says there's something, of course, to avoid, as we talked about last week. That we're to not be arrogant, to not put our hope in wealth. And then there's a set of things to pursue, to put our hope in God, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous, and to be willing to share. And to keep from being arrogant, to keep our hope in Jesus from migrating to our hope in things, and then to avoid the assumption that everything in our life is for our consumption, the Bible tells us very clearly we are to pursue a life of generosity. Paul warns us that without working on generosity, that our possessions will possess us. Our possessions can quickly overtake us and become our hope and our focus. Back in 1783, Edward Jenner, you know him, right? Of course you don't, but that's him. Back in 1783, Edward Jenner had what was at the time a crazy idea. Throughout Europe, smallpox was laying waste to the population. And warning, don't Google smallpox and look at the pictures. You don't need to see that. I looked, believe me, just trust me. Really gross. Smallpox was ravaging Europe, and up to 80% of the young children who were getting it were dying because of it. Many mothers tried unsuccessfully to seclude their children to protect them from exposure. But it wasn't working. Jenner had a different approach. He believed that it was possible to take steps to make a person immune from the disease instead of having to hide from it. Jenner, you see, he had noticed that the milkmaids, you know, the ladies who went to the cows and gathered the milk, The ladies who had previously been sick with cowpox 
Not a single one of them were ever getting smallpox. And smallpox was far more severe and dangerous than was the cowpox. So Jenner's idea was to expose people to the fluid from an active boil on the side of a cow. On purpose. Right? And sure enough, those who followed Jenner's plan seemed untouchable no matter how severe the smallpox infection got around them. In his medical papers, Jenner invented a new word, vaccine. You've heard of that word, right? Based on the Latin word for cow, vaca. If you know Spanish, that's also vaca, right? Some of the nastiest diseases in the world now are under control thanks to the use of vaccines. All thanks to this idea from Jenner. For affluent people today, there's a threat just as devastating as smallpox was in Jenner's time. We'll call it affluenza. Right? If you didn't get that, it's on the screen. And as we saw last week, this disease is rampant in our culture, and I don't think anybody would argue otherwise. And it causes bouts of arrogance, and it causes chronic misplaced hope. And the symptoms, of course, aren't always obvious. They usually sneak up on you, don't they? They occur in us kind of like cancer. Under the surface, it begins to grow, and you don't even know it's there. And it can go undetected for a very long time. And while it's going, it's destroying your insides without you even knowing about it. But as Paul taught, there's a way to immunize yourself against affluenza. No matter how rich you get, you can protect yourself from the negative side effects of wealth. The antidote is generosity. When you take everything that Jesus taught about being generous and you distill it down, a couple of common themes emerge. You can think of them as the two peas in the pod, and they're on your notes if you're following along on sermon notes. The first P in the pod stands for priority. The key to Jenner's vaccination was to apply the technique before the outbreak occurred. And the very same thing is true when it comes to generosity. If you wait until you're rich, you'll probably never start. No matter how rich or how poor you might feel right now, right now is the time to be generous. Now you might be thinking, hey, hold on, wait a second, Pastor. I mean, you have no idea. Got braces for the kids, got to save up for college. I'm retired. I got limited income. I, I had a business plan go bad. I, I got to pay cell phone bills. Uh, we got these car loans and that new bass boat wasn't free, right? If you knew how broke I was, Pastor, this wouldn't apply to me, right? Anybody ever feel that way? I kind of feel that way. But actually, generosity isn't dependent on your finances at all. As counterintuitive as it seems, generosity begins wherever you're at. That's what it means to make it a priority. To, to keep something a priority, you have to stick with it, even when everything inside of you might be screaming to go the other direction. And giving means more than just simply writing a check, or in this day and age, digitally giving. Giving is much more than just that. And for some, it's not even possible, in fact, to be generous in finances at this point. But they can still be generous with other things. Think about the vaccinations that Jenner gave. There is something unnatural to exposing yourself to the diseased pus oozing out of the side of a cow, right? You ever seen a boil on an animal? Ooh, gross, right? Especially if you're perfectly healthy. You're like, I don't want to touch that. Ick. Ooh. 
And with Jenner's vaccination, when you did this, you didn't just get, you know, like a little localized rash from it, a little sore spot on your arm. But going up and rubbing this pus and ooze and goo all over yourself, it made you get pretty sick. Really sick. But that sickness could save your life. And it takes that kind of foresight and courage to make generosity your priority. When you make giving a priority, something happens inside of you, especially when it's challenging to do it. You, it, it it's like loosening your grip on the value system whose motto says that money is the key to life and the key to happiness and the key to safety. In that split second, when you reject that way of thinking, and instead you say, my hope is not in riches, but in him who richly provides, your whole outlook changes. And suddenly, your eyes begin to open to a value system that is no longer measured and dominated by dollars. Now the second P in that pod is percentage. Now I have yet to preach on this here, but if you're wondering, some of you might be at this point, I don't actually teach that tithing, as in 10% offering, is mandatory out of the New Testament. Let me explain. For some people, 10% is more than they can give at this moment. And for many others, 10% is not in any way giving sacrificially. And giving sacrificially is the biblical principle of giving. So that's what I think. I'm not going to tell you today what to give. We already took the offering. We're not going to send the plates around for a second time. I'm not going to ask you to give more. There is a reason I'm preaching this now, because Christmas is coming, right? Christmas screws up everybody's finances in some way. Well, not everybody's. There's a few people who probably plan far ahead, but the rest of us were like, wow, that was expensive. Of course it was. It comes every year. The biblical principle of giving is to give with joy sacrificially. And I'm not going to tell you what to give. It's not what I believe is my spot. But I am going to suggest to you, at the very least, to implement a good practice for being wealthy. And that practice is simply this. Each and every year, give a little bit more. Some years it might just be 2 or 5%. Some years it might be a whole lot more than that. But when you get used to giving this amount, giving a little bit more, doesn't hurt quite so bad. It's called incremental increase. And over time, if you keep incrementally increasing, you continue to live on what you had, and you're able to give more and more and more. And as you do that, you begin to see the impact of your giving have tremendous reach and influence. For some of us, right now, 10%, you might be going, man, I couldn't give 10%. Maybe you make that as your goal for a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. I don't know your situation. For some of you, you go, yeah, 10%. I can just write that check today. Well, then you probably need to examine your heart and see where God is calling you to grow. I know, all of a sudden, when I started talking about money, this got uncomfortable, didn't it? Because it gets really personal. But you know what else is really uncomfortable? A colonoscopy. (laughs) They save countless lives, don't they? It just depends on how badly you want to protect yourself from the effects of wealth. This isn't about being good. This isn't about earning favor with God by giving. 
We're not bribing God by throwing some money on the offering plate. This is about what we put our hope in. The most important thing is just to start, just to give, to be generous. Even if that's 1% or 2% more. Generosity isn't just something you ought to do. It's a vaccination from allowing your hope to migrate. It's a vaccination from allowing you to become arrogant and basically being bad at being rich. Generosity isn't just something you do whenever you have more. It's something we need to practice constantly so we will know what to do when we do have more. But here's the thing. Being generous isn't easy. But it doesn't mean that we've got to take a, pow- a, a vow of poverty either. It simply means following a plan to keep your giving in proportion with your blessing. Giving back what God has already had and has trusted you with. Paul commands us to be generous, not because he needed our money, not because God needed our money. It's his money already, right? There's more to generosity than just money. There's more to generosity than simply just giving something away. And just as wealth has a negative side effect, giving it away has a very positive side effect. And I pray that we learn to live with those positive side effects of generosity and that we are a blessing to the world around us for Jesus' fame and glory. I close with this thought. Think about this for a second. How generous has God been to you? Let me read you one final passage. It's one you know, but listen closely anyhow. It's important in understanding just how generous God has actually been to you and to me. That passage is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave that he gave his one and only son. There wasn't a bunch. It was all of them. The one and only. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but inherit eternal life. According to John 3.16, the ultimate purpose of God's generosity was to change lives. God gave so that people would not perish but have eternal lives. And your generosity should have that very same focus. Generosity is not about money. It's about changed lives. The life of yours being changed and those who receive being changed. Whenever it becomes money-focused or about money-based ideas, generosity loses its purity and is no longer operating out of the hope that we find in John 3.16. That's one of the reasons we will continue as a church to give you opportunities to be generous. Things like the the tree here. Mittens and hats. Might seem small to some of us, but it's a chance to be generous. Love Lift Ukraine. Giving money to feed my starving children. Taking a box out of our lobby there, filling it full of things that we might send it through Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child to the ends of the earth. The benevolence fund we take next week that the deacons collect and they distribute. We have people who give so that we can feed families and children here on Wednesday nights that we might tell them the good news about Jesus Christ. We give to missionaries all over the world. And not only that, we give when we serve. We have people who take time out of their busy lives to come and teach Sunday school, vacation Bible school, Wednesday evening programming. We have people who who go out of their way to make sure our facility is well taken care of and clean. 
We have people who, who wash dishes after every funeral. We have people who play the piano with a gift that God gave them. We have people who cook so others might eat and serve so that they may see Jesus' love. We have been given many things. And we are going to keep on giving you opportunities to give those things away. Your time, your treasure, your talents. Because much has been given to us, much is expected of us. So folks, hear me on this. Give out of joy. Give out of generosity. Give out of abundance. Give because it changes lives. And most of all, give because it honors God. Amen. Let's pray.